Hey guys, welcome to your AP Statistics Chapter 8 lesson, video number one. Today we're going to talk about linear regression. Fat versus protein. This is going to be our example to get us going. The following is the scatter plot of total fat versus protein for 30 items on the Burger King menu. So you got protein on the horizontal, you got fat on the vertical, and you can see how they match up. The correlation in this example is 0 0.83, so that makes sense. It's a positive correlation, fairly strong. Um, and looking at the scatter plot, that seems to, to match up with what we're seeing visually. You can see that there's a, a somewhat linear relationship there. Um, and certainly there's a positive association that as the amount of protein increases, there tends to be an increase in the amount of fat. It says there seems to be a linear association between these two variables, but it doesn't tell us what that association is, what that line would be, what is the best line to represent this data. We can say more about the linear relationship between two quantitative variables with a model. A model simplifies reality to help us understand underlying power, uh, patterns and relationships. The linear model is just an equation of a straight line. All lines are straight, but straight line through the data. The points in the scatter plot don't all line up, but a, but a line can summarize the general pattern with only a couple of parameters. And that, that's the whole thing. It gives us an overall picture of what's going on, and it simplifies the situation by just having two parameters, the, the slope and the y-intercept. The linear, the linear model can help us understand how the values are associated. The model won't be per perfect regardless of the line we draw. Some points will be above the line and some will be below. The estimate made from a model is the predicted value and it's denoted as y hat and that's how it's referred to um, and that's to differentiate from y values that are actual observations of that response variable. So y hat is a predicted value, y is an observed value. The difference between the observed value and its associated predicted value is called the residual. Um, so think about this, or residual error. And if you think about like residue on something, that's the funky stuff that's kind of left over. Well, that's what the, the residual error is. We give our best model and it's the funky little error that's left over. To find the residuals, you always subtract the predicted value from the observed one. So residual equals observed minus predicted y minus y hat. A negative residual means the prediction value, the predicted value is too big, an overestimate. Okay, and if you look over at the picture, you've got one there because it's y minus y hat, and that gives you an overestimate. Okay, um, because the y hat value is bigger than the y value, so when you subtract it, you end up with a negative number. A positive residual, however, means the predicted value is too small. It's an underestimate. So y hat is smaller, it's an underestimate, than y. So when you do uh, y minus y hat, you end up with a positive value. In the figure, the estimated fat of the BK broiler chicken sandwich is 36 grams, while the true value of fat is 25 grams, so the residual is negative 11 grams of fat. So you actually get more protein for less fat than what the model would predict if you get the BK broiler chicken sandwich. Some residuals are positive, others are negative, and on average they cancel each other out. So in other words, if we add them up, they always add up to be zero. So just like we did with deviations, we have to adjust for that. So we can't uh, assess how well the line fits by adding up all the residuals because it's always going to be zero. So similar to what we did with deviations, we square the residuals and add the squares. The smaller the sum, the better the fit. So the line of best fit is the line for which the sum of the squared residuals is smallest, the least squares line, or the least squares regression line, and sometimes you'll see it abbreviated as the LSRL. So line of best fit, linear model, least squares line, least square regression line, and LSRL all mean the same thing. They all mean the line that best fits the data. So correlation and the line. The figure shows the scatter plot of z-scores of fat and protein. So they went and found the z-scores. 
if a burger has average protein content, it should have about average fat content too. Moving one standard deviation away from the mean in X moves us our standard deviations away from the mean in Y. And you can see on the little picture there, they show you that um, as you move from one point to the next on the, the graph, if you go one standard deviation to the right, you're going to go up in terms of X. You're going to go up our standard deviations um, in terms of Y. So that's always going to be the relationship there. Put generally, moving any number of standard deviations away from the mean in X moves us R times that number of standard deviations away from the mean in Y. And that's an important thing for you to know. R cannot be bigger than 1 in absolute value, so each predicted Y tends to be closer to its mean in standard deviations because it's got to be between um, 0 and 1 as far as its absolute value goes. So when you move one whole standard deviation in X, you're going to move at most one standard deviation um, in, in Y because the biggest R can be as 1. Now, since R usually has an absolute value less than 1, typically you're going to be moving fewer than one whole standard deviation in Y for every standard deviation in X that you move. And this property of the linear model is called regression to the mean. The line is also called the regression line. So like I said, regression line, least squares regression line, LSRL, um, least squares model, linear model, all those things refer to the linear equation that best represents the line. Remember from algebra that a, a straight line, and I know I know Mr. Mellor hates the term straight line, so I, I hate saying it, but your book uses it all the time, so I'll continue to, to use it. But yes, all lines are straight. Can be written as y equals mx plus b. Um, your calculator likes y equals ax plus b. In statistics, we use a slightly different notation, y hat, because remember, this is a line to make predictions, so we use the hat, equals b with a sub-zero, b or b naught, not meaning the zero there, or B0, plus B1 times X. Um, so the B with the subscript zero is the Y-intercept, and the B1 is the slope. We write Y-hat to emphasize that, that the points that satisfy this equation are just our predicted values, not the actual values. They're not anything we've observed. This model says that our predictions from our model follow a line. If the model is a good one, the data values will scatter closely around it. They may not all hit it, but they're going to be really tight in there by it. We write B1 and B0 for the slope and intercept of the line. B1 is the slope, which tells us how rapidly Y hat changes with respect to X on average. And B0 is the Y intercept, which tells us where the line crosses, intercepts the Y axis. In our model, we have slope B1. The slope is built from the correlation and the standard deviations. B1 is equal to R times the standard deviation of Y over the standard deviation of X. A beautiful thing is that our calculator, when we do, uh, just like when we do one of our stats, it does all kinds of good stuff for us. When we tell it we want the linear regression model, um, like we did before to get R, it's going to give us the slope. Our slope is always in units of Y per unit of X because it's change in Y over change in X. In our model, we also have an intercept, B0. The intercept is built from the means and the slope. And the point X bar, Y bar is always on your linear regression line. So you can find the slope by doing Y bar minus B1 times X bar. Our intercept is always in units of Y because it's a Y intercept. The regression line for the Burger King data fits the data well. The equation is predicted fat equals 6.8 plus 0 0.97 times protein. So if we let X equal protein and Y equal fat, um, then it would be Y hat equals 6.8 plus 0 0.97 times X. The predicted fat content for a BK broiler chicken sandwich with 30 grams of protein is 6.8 plus 0 0.97 times 30, and that equals 35.9 grams of fat. So if you want to figure out the predicted um, 
fat in any uh, Burger King item given its protein, you just take the amount of protein, your x value, and plug it in. The regression line and real units. Since regression and correlation are closely related, we need to check the same conditions for regressions as we did for correlations. So once you check these conditions and they hold, you know that you can do linear regression and you know that the correlation is going to be something meaningful. Okay, so let's review what they are. Quantitative variables condition. Both variables have to be quantitative or you're not going to have numbers to plug in. It's just not going to work. Straight enough condition, you've got to look at the scatter plot and check that a line is a reasonable model for what you have, that there's no bend to it. Outlier condition, outliers can mess up everything. So make sure that there's not outliers. If there is, do your work with the outlier and do the work without the outlier and report both. All right, residuals revisited. The linear model assumes that the relationship between the two variables is a perfect straight line. The residuals are the part of the, the data that hasn't been modeled. Like I said, it's like the residue. It's what's left over. So the actual data value equals the model plus the residual. Or equivalently, if we subtract model from both sides, residual equals data minus model. Or in symbols, we use a little e for error. It is the residual error. We don't use R because R is correlation, so we use little e for the error part of residual error, and that equals y minus y hat. So ob observed minus predicted. Data minus model mean the same thing. Residuals help us to see whether the model makes sense. When a regression model is appropriate, nothing interesting should be left behind. It should just be a completely random little cloud, hopefully all close to zero. After we fit a regression model, we usually plot the residuals in the hope of finding, well, nothing. The residuals for the BK menu regression look appropriately boring. Okay, If you notice zero on the, the vertical axis there, um, they, the points are kind of scattered all around that. They're not all positive or all negative. They're, it should be scattered like that. There's no pattern to the positive and negative um, values. It's a nice cloud. That's what you want to see. The standard deviation of the residuals, SE, measures how much the points spread around the regression line. So you want that to be small. Okay? You want SE to be small. And you're going to have to interpret this in the context of problems. So you really need to know that it measures how much the points spread around the regression line. Check to make sure that the residual plot about the, the, has about the same amount of scatter throughout. Check the equal variance assumption with the does the plot thicken condition. So here, if you look, there may be a little bit of a fluctuation there. But overall, it looks like, you know, with the nice fluffy cloud that we have there, that the residuals are fairly evenly spaced throughout the data, throughout all of the horizontal values, all of the protein bits. Whoops. Went backwards, should have gone forwards. Okay, we estimate standard deviation of the residuals using the square root of the sum of the residuals squared. Remember, we have to square them, or else they, they just add up to zero, divided by n minus 2. Um, the reason we do n minus 2 instead of n minus 1 is because now that we have two variables, we lose um, 2 degrees of freedom. So we divide by n minus 2, because there's x and y. We don't need to subtract the mean because the mean of the residuals is um, zero, always. E bar always is zero, so we don't have to subtract the mean. We can make a histogram or a normal probabil probability plot of the residuals. It should, it should be unimodal and roughly symmetric. It's going to be real easy with our calculators to have a list of the residuals, and then once we, we bring up that list, we can do all kinds of things with it. We can uh, look at the histogram, we can look at the normal probability plot, we can look at a scatter plot of the residuals, we can do all that. Then we can apply the 68.95.99.7 rule to see how well the regression model describes the data. R squared, the variation accounted for. So now we're going to kind of shift subjects. R squared, the R is capitalized, but it is the correlation squared. The variation in the residuals is key to a single well model fit. In the B menu items example, total fat has a standard deviation of 16.4 grams. 
the standard deviation of the residuals is 9 grams. So you can look at the fat versus the residuals. So you can see that the residuals is quite a bit less variability than the original data, the original y values. If the correlation were 1.0 and the model predicted the fat values perfectly, the residuals would all be zero and have no variation because we'd have perfect lines. So there would be no residual error. As it is, the correlation is 0 0.3, not percent. I mean, you know, it, it's good, but it's not exactly 1.0. However, we did see that the model uh, residuals had less variation than the total flown. You can either look at the standard deviations there and go, yes, 9.2 is less than 16.4. I think the box plots make a nice visual. You can look and go, oh, yeah, there's more variability among the, uh, the original fat values than there are among the residuals. We can determine how much of the variation is accounted for by the model and how much is left in the residuals. So how much of that variation you can see there in the the box plot for the fat how much of that was accounted for by the model versus how much is left there in the residuals because if it was perfect we would just have like one little line there everything residuals would just all be zero all in 100 percent of the variation in fat would be explained by the model but that's not the case the squared correlation r squared gives the fraction of the data's variance accounted or variability accounted for by the model and that's an important thing for you to know you're going to have to be able to apply that in the context of problems thus one minus r squared is the fraction of the original variance left in the residuals for the bk model r squared equals 0 0.83 squared or 0 0.69 so 31% of the variability in total fat has been left in the residuals. The good news is that 69% of the variability in total fat has been explained by its linear model um, with protein. All regression analyses um, include this statistic, although by tradition it's written capital R squared pronounced R squared, and R squared of zero means that none of the variance in the data um, is in the model. All of it is still in the residuals and your model is terrible. And we do call this the coefficient of determination. So R is the correlation, R squared is the coefficient of determination. And so you need to know that. You need to know when someone asks you what is the correlation, you need to know that's R. And when someone asks you what is the coefficient of determination, you need to know that that's R squared. You could also just be asked what percent of the variability is explained by the linear relationship between your two variables. And you need to know, oh, they want R squared. When inter interpreting a regression model, you need to tell what R squared means. In the BK example, 69% of the variation in total, uh, total fat is accounted for by variation in the protein content. R squared should always be between 0% and 100%. Make sure a good R squared value depends on the kind of data you are analyzing and on what you want to do with it. Okay, so what's good? Well, it depends on what you want to do. The standard deviation of the residuals can give us more information about the usefulness of the regression by telling us how much scatter there is around the line. Okay, so that's going to be it for video one. Meet me back here um, when you're ready for video two, and we will wrap up this linear regression lesson.